Well, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Sunday morning, we get to sing and we get to listen to God's word and we get to come before the Lord and worship. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm excited again to come before you and bring to you what the Lord has been teaching me throughout this week in Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to go into chapter 17 as well. So if you will turn to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start from verse 24. I'm going to read all the way to Matthew chapter 17, verse 8. Let's read it and let's ask God to help us understand. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and to inspire us and to tell us what he would have for us to learn. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes become white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When disciples heard this, it fell to their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Let's bow the word prayer. Amen. That's God's word. Powerful. Our Father, we are encountering you this morning and just reading this word and encountering Jesus Christ who was so powerful, so glorious. And Father, we know that there's much for us to learn. So we pray, Father, for you to come, for the Spirit of God to enter in our hearts right now, to inspire us, to teach us what you have to, what you have, what you have to learn, and so that our lives can be changed for your glory. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seeing and experiencing changes us. Seeing and experiencing changes us. When I was younger, I loved traveling. I love saving up my vacation. Uh, I used to work in a corporate environment where I get about three weeks vacation. And there I would save it all up. You know, I would you know, not take any sick days. I would not take any little vacations. I would not take any rest. I would save up all three weeks so I could travel somewhere, so I can go to some village, some faraway village, like in Nepal or Tibet or some other countries that no one would travel to. I would go there and live there for three weeks or travel in the area for three weeks just so that I can learn about the people in the area, how they live their life, how they practice their life, what backgrounds and experiences they endure, and so that I can learn from them. I didn't want to think about America as the only place that, that the world centers around. I didn't want to think L.A. as the place where the world comes to, even though it is. I, I knew in my own heart that many people live a different life than the lifestyle of us, which are in L.A. We are very different than the rest of the world, and certainly we're not the center of the world. And so I want to go to other parts of the world to discover what they would have to teach me. So I went. I went to these places. I traveled broadly uh, abroad, and, and, and I learned a lot. I went to villages. I, I, I bicycled through these villages. I grew a lot through these experiences. However, as much as I grew these experiences, and, and knowing and seeing really changed me, seeing other people's lives really changed me. There's one person that we all need to see today, and he will forever change us, and that person is God himself. You see, we are all going to experience and see God one day, and our experiences are going to be the same or be different depending on whether we know the Lord Jesus Christ or not. If we don't know Jesus, then we're going to see God and experience God one day in that judgment day. In that judgment day, God's going to show His glory. He's going to show His power. He's going to show His strength. He's going to show us how sinful we are. In the light of His power and strength, purity and holiness, we're going to melt in His presence. And certainly, that's the experience of so many people in this world when they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to melt in His presence because they're sinners in front of a holy and a righteous God. God, however, desired for us to learn something else about him. He desired for us to experience him in a different way. He desired for us to experience his love, his grace, his mercy, his truth, and his, his goodness, his kindness. 
And that is why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to earth to display His love, to display His mercy, to display His kindness. Jesus came to earth to restore us unto God. We're sinners before God, but through Christ, we get to be restored. We get to return to that original purpose, original plan which God has set out for us. We get to be pure before Him again. And that is through Jesus, who came to earth, lived the perfect life, only to give His perfect life unto us. Jesus lived the perfect life, died on the cross, so that He may pay for the penalty of our sins, as well as give His perfect life to us. In Jesus Christ, we get to be made like Him. In Jesus Christ, we get to be made pure as God is pure. In Jesus Christ, we're restored unto God Himself. This is the promise of Christ to all who will believe unto Him. If you believe unto Him, place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you get to be as pure as He is pure. You get to be as holy as God is holy. That is the promise of God. Seeing and experiencing Jesus Christ forever changes us. And that is today's message. Seeing and experiencing Jesus forever changes us. We're going to see this today in Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Actually, from verse 24 to Matthew chapter 17, verse 8. We're going to see how seeing and experiencing Jesus changes us. There are going to be three effects that Jesus would have on you if you see and experience Jesus. Three effects. The first effect is this. If you see and experience Jesus, he will compel you to live for him. If you see and experience Jesus Christ, He will compel you to live for Him. We see this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 27. Verse 24, Matthew chapter 16 says this, Then Jesus told His disciples, If anyone would come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And what shall a man give return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glorious Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. God's Word. So in order for us to understand what this passage is saying right here, we have to understand the overall gist of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry has been about Him being the Messiah. Jesus' ministry has been about Him being the Savior of the world. He is the promised one, the one that comes in the glory of the Father. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, it says this regarding the Son of Man, regarding the Messiah, it says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. He came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all the people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. There is one who is powerful, there is one who is full of strength, full of glory, His kingdom shall not be destroyed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. However, as we'll also see in the book of Matthew, Jesus has been gentle, has been kind, he has been loving, he's been showing himself his humanity. In fact, when Jesus came to earth, he looked like anyone else. You walk on the Hollywood Boulevard, you see a person pass by, you don't remember this person's face. This person doesn't look any more appealing to you than other person, than any other person just by appearance alone. That is the Lord Jesus. He looked just like you. He looked just like me. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, he gives us a clue on the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. It's interesting. Like Jesus was beautiful. I mean, he was God, but at the same time, if you just pass him by, there's nothing in his earthly appearance that would make you think of him any otherwise. I mean, he just looked like a man, like anyone else. And in that light, what we've been seeing is that in the book of Matthew, we'll be seeing people rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And people thought, you know what, you're just a man. Why do you make yourself to look like God? Why do you make yourself seem like you're God? But Jesus has been doing so. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he said, I am the one who fulfills all the righteousness of God. He's the one who can fulfill all the righteousness, all the, uh, all the requirements of God's, God's standard. And he is God himself. And the Pharisees upset at Jesus, saying, you know what, you're just a man like me. You don't look like anyone else. So why do you make yourself to look like God? And Jesus said, no, I am God. And you guys are the hypocrites. You guys are the sinners. And you guys are, are whitewashed tombs. And you guys are pretenders. And the Pharisees have been 
were well, quite mad at Jesus, quite angry at Jesus. So to the point in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, we see the Pharisees applauding against Jesus, seeing how they may destroy him, how may they kill him. Nevertheless, Jesus never backed down. He's been proclaiming himself and who he is. He said, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of Man. I am God himself. And so this is what we see also, hallelujah, here in verse 27. It says this, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in glory of his Father, and he will repay each person according to what he's done. This again is a proclamation, just as the proclamation made in Daniel chapter 7. He is the Son of Man. He's going to come in the glory of the Father. He's going to come in strength. He's going to come in power. He's going to come in his dominion. He's going to come in his kingdom. You will be glorified. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm coming, and you will see this. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 says the same thing. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with golden crown on his head, a sharp sickle in his hand. He's going to come, he's going to judge. He has a sickle in his hand. He's going to reap. Those who are tares are going to be judged forever. Those who are weak are going to be restored. And they're going to be restored unto God. They're going to be received unto, unto the Father. He's going to judge. He's the powerful one. He's going to bring his kingdom. In light of who Jesus is, in light of his power, glory, in light of his strength, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, 26, tell us how we should live in light of that. We saw this. We saw this last week, and we're going to continue on in this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. If you knew how powerful Jesus is, if you knew how glorious he is, if you knew this upcoming kingdom, then you would live this way. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what would a profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeit his soul? What shall the man give return for his soul? This is how you would live. And we saw this last week. You would deny yourself. You know how powerful, how glorious Jesus is. You would deny yourself. You deny your flesh. You deny your sin. You deny your temptation. You would deny everything that you're attracted to. You say, you know what, I'd rather have Jesus Christ because I'm more attracted to Him than anything else in this world. I'd rather deny that and have Jesus Christ. Yeah. You would deny yourself. And also, you would carry your cross and follow Him. That means that you would actually sacrifice. Jesus Himself is going against the, the trend. He's going against the trend of the politics. He's going against the trend of the religious institutions. He's, follow, he's, he's following His own trend. And you, he, he was resisting the book of Matthew. So will you. Be resistant if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And they might crucify you. They might kill you. But you say, you know what? I will follow Jesus because I know the upcoming glory. I know the upcoming dominion. I know the upcoming kingdom. I'd rather follow him. I'd rather lose my life in this world to gain that which is to come. This is the promise of the Messiah. As Jesus was proclaiming this, he's also saying, hey, if you are choosing to do this, you actually are going to sacrifice the things of this world for me. So there is a trade, there's a transaction language here also in verse 25 to 26. It says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What would a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and forfeit his soul? What would a man give in return for his soul? There's a transaction, there's a trade, there's a giving up for gaining something else. If you give up what is in this world, you will gain what is to come. Yes. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 says the same thing. Paul, his life and inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, I count all things lost in comparison with the surpassing glory that's found in Christ. You count all things lost. You count your relationships and whatever you treasure to be lost. Like if God's called you to be a missionary, right? I love to be with these people. I love to be with my parents. I love to be with my fa uh, uh, other family members, extended family members. And God's called you to be a missionary somewhere else. You say, no, I'd rather be with God. I'd rather follow the calling of God than even the good things of this world. I would, read, I would surrender even the good things of this world. I would give up the good things of this world. Jesus talked about this throughout his ministry, especially in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. Again, a transaction, a trade says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 to 30. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold from now, now in this time, houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution in the age to come, eternal life. There is a reward coming, a reward of a hundredfold for those who are willing to surrender the houses, their mother, their brother, their sister, their 
their treasure relationship for Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, there's a hundredfold of reward for you. If you know the power and the glory and the strength which I will come, this would not be distant from you. This will not seem, seem uh, impossible for you. Say, how much is a hundredfold? Hundredfold people think it's a hundred times. No, I think it's a, a lot more than a hundred times. You see, illustrate with this. You fold a piece of paper one time. That's one fold. Then you get two pieces of paper, right? You fold it another time, you get how many? Four. You fold the third time, you get eight. You fold the fourth time, you get how many? Sixteen. Now fold the thirty times. You can't count it, okay? I'll tell you how, how much it is. Fold the thirty times, you get one billion seventy-three million seven hundred one thousand eight hundred twenty-four. That's how much you get for folding it thirty times. You fold it for a hundred times, this is what you get. I never knew this number existed, but this is what you get. One nanillion. 201 octillion, 64 septillion, 595 sextillion, 270 quintillion, 167 quadrillion, 685 trillion, 882 billion, 431 million, 343,616. Okay, that's how much you get from one sacrifice one piece of paper now imagine if you sacrifice 10 or 20 or 1000 pieces of paper i mean the multiplication goes on god is coming in glory if you knew how glorious god is if you know how powerful god is you know how much glory is going to be revealed in you and certainly all the sacrifices in the world make sense and this is what we see in the life of moses as well when we see in the life of moses moses was was uh, was charged by God to do a difficult job. He was. He was charged by God to do a hard job, which was to lead the people of God. The people of God were complaining, they were obstinate, they were sinful. And by the time Moses got to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from the Lord, people of God already made a calf, a golden calf, and worshipped and bowed down to it. This is a difficult people to lead it really is and moses wasn't i mean moses did the job because god called him to god was saying you know what moses i'm it's a hard job are you sure you want to do it i mean i, I can wipe them out and then i'll start with you moses saying no i'll do it but i'll do it under, under one condition i'll do it if you do this for me in exodus chapter 33 verse 18 moses says this to yahweh to the lord show me your glory Amen. Show me your glory and all this will be enough. If I could just see how beautiful you are, if I could just see the reward that's coming, if I could just see the dominion and the power and the strength, which I will be a part of, then this present trial, which I'm in right now, will all be worth it. You'll be worth it. I will suffer gladly for the sake of the Lord. Paul also says the same thing in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider the suffering of this present time not worthy or not worth compared to the glory that is revealed in us. There's a glory that's going to be revealed in you and in me, and the suffering of this time are not worthy in comparison. I mean, willing to forsake everything, so I'm willing to suffer, willing to deny my flesh, deny myself, carry the cross, suffer for the sake of Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory that is revealed. Paul has seen something, and forever changed him and said, you know what, I'm willing to sacrifice everything in this world for what I've saw, what I saw, what I've seen. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, says the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. This is the promise of the Savior. If you build your life around hay, stub, hay straw, whatever this thing, you, you, you build a, your life upon that will burn up, which is your career, your ambitions, the things of this world, money, possessions, get to eternal life, all that burns up, you're left with nothing. But if you build your life on the kingdom, on sharing the gospel, on bringing people to Jesus, on discipling other people for Christ, for that eternal life, on giving to the Lord, sacrificing, serving, and certainly your work will survive in that day, you will receive a reward. You're building gold and silver and precious stones on that foundation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be rewarded. And certainly that means that you will have already seen the glory that is to come. You knew 
the glory that's come. You knew the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you're willing to sacrifice everything that's worth for that glory. So seeing the Lord, seeing Jesus Christ, experiencing the Lord changes us. It causes us and compels us to live for Him. We saw that here in this beginning portion of this passage in verse 24 to verse 27, but that's not the end. We're going to see a couple more effects. So that's the first effect. It compels you to live for Him if you see the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only so, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ compels you to live joyfully for Him. It compels you to live joyfully for Him. We're going to see this from verse 28 to verse 4 of chapter 17. Verse 28, it says this, Truly I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man come in His kingdom. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes become white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. It's good that we're here. So we're going to stop right there for a second. So at this point, what we have seen is that Jesus has been telling all, hey, if you want to follow me, if you see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to follow me, and certainly you will sacrifice everything in this world for Him. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of the cross, right? And Jesus, I've been telling you all this, and disciples have been following that as well. They've been suffering alongside Lord Jesus Christ, have been despised. The Pharisees can't come against Jesus. The disciples are taking the heat for that as well. And it's kind of been disappointing for them, discouraging, I would even say. And they were waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to, to kind of show forth His glory. And Jesus has been promising His glory, but yet Jesus now comes back and says, Hey, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die in the hands of the high priests. And, and uh, it's going to be a difficult time. And you should be ready. And disciples are kind of discouraged and saying, You know what? When is the glorious time going to come? When is the glorious time going to come? It's been a lot of cross, but not a whole lot of crown. It's been a lot of pain, but not a lot of gain. It's been a lot of suffering, but not a whole lot of glory. And so disciples are wondering, Jesus, like, like give, us a, give us something here. And Jesus says, no, I will give you something. Verse 20 says this. I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Yeah. Some of you who are here, you will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. It's true. Now we read this verse, we're wondering, hey, that's, that's, that's an encouraging, encouraging statement from the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it's kind of a, a difficult statement for us to comprehend. It's difficult because, well, we're still waiting for the coming of the kingdom here. We're still waiting for the Son of Man to come in His kingdom. So, so, so... You know, and all the people there in the days of Jesus, they died. So unless there's some people there are still alive today, which I doubt, I mean, that's difficult for us to understand. I mean, are the people, are the people here who are 2,000 years old or more? I mean, are they still waiting? So here's the interpretation, the proper inter interpretation of this verse. And in, in throughout, throughout the whole, whole synoptic gospel, whether it be Mark, Luke, or Matthew, we see this illustration of the trans, uh, transfiguration or illustration of this promise rather um, here in verse 28 which is that some who are standing here will not die until they see the son of man come in his kingdom in every single statement of the son of man come in his kingdom and there are people who will not die and they will see the son of man come in his kingdom what follows it is the transfiguration in all three all three gospel accounts where the transfiguration is recorded Matthew, Luke, and Mark. So what Jesus is saying is clear. The transfiguration is the fulfillment of the coming of the Son of Man here in this passage. And the people, some of the people who will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom are just the three people we see here, see here in verse 1 of chapter 17. There are Peter, James, and John. That's it. Three people, some of them. Three people, Peter, James, and John, who saw the glory of God in his kingdom as Jesus revealed himself to them. So we're going to dig into Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. It says this. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So it took three people, Peter, James, and John. These are the three closest disciples to Jesus Christ. They're the three disciples that were with Jesus when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter in that room. 
the three disciples also who were with Jesus when Jesus was crying out before the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. The three closest disciples to Jesus Christ to get to see the glory of God. And Jesus led them up a high mountain. This mountain is not recorded in Scripture as to what mountain it is. Some people say it's Mount Tabor. That's a traditional mountain, but probably not that mountain because that mountain traditionally had a village on top of it. And so this probably was a mountain that was pretty secluded um, from, uh, from population. And uh, some people say it's Mount Hermon, but Mount Hermon is 9,000 feet tall, and that mountain has snow throughout the whole entire year. So, and so I don't know if that mountain, but some, some say perhaps the mountain is called Mount Muron, which is about 4,000 feet tall, and that mountain is the northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee. And so we can imagine perhaps that is the mountain, but it's not the most important thing. Jesus left him up a mountain, okay? Left him a mountain. And so what happened is this. Left a mountain, and we see in Luke chapter 9, verse 32, the disciples were sleeping. They were sleeping. So Jesus left a mountain, the disciples got to the mountain, were tired, and they were sleeping. He said, why were they sleeping? Well, the disciples probably were discouraged. We were discouraged and depressed, and for all the suffering that you're going to have to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, you know what, I'm just going to sleep for a while. I'm going to sleep my troubles away. They were discouraged, they were low, low on faith. Jesus, however, in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, we see that he was praying. So Jesus was praying. The disciples were sleeping. At this point, something miraculous happened. Something beautiful happened. Jesus transfigured before them. He turned into another person. Here in verse 2, he says, He was transfigured before him, before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. There is a, a being that is not like any being in this world in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he was man, but he was God. He had the full glory of God in his person. His face shone bright. His clothes was white as light. This is the light of God. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, it says this. This is the light of God that, that shines the city of Jerusalem, the new heavens, new earth. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. His lamp is the lamp. There's no need for light bulbs. There's no need for sun. There's no need for luminary bodies. Jesus Christ has shown enough light in that day that it's going to, able, it's going to be able to brighten up the entire universe. That's how bright his light is. So Jesus here shows this light. The glory of him is demonstrated to the disciples, but not only so. Standing next to him, we see here in verse 3, there were Moses and Elijah. He said, why Moses and Elijah? Well, Moses is an important person in the Old Testament. Moses is a writer of the law of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. The law of God is the, the detailed portion of scripture that, that tells us who God is, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. If you read the law of God, you will bow down before your face, before on your face before God, knowing how sinful you are. The law of God is a standard. It tells you how holy he is and and by and, and it tells us the effect of it that uh, by 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 uh, what you will have on us. Even in Romans chapter three, verse twenty, this is this is how the law of God will affect you. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If you only know the law of God, if you only know the holiness of God, you will know how simple you are. You will know how much you fall short of the standard of God. If you know how much you fall short of the standard of God, then what you would turn to is turn, you would turn to the mercy of God. You would turn to the grace of God. You will bow down before God and ask Him for mercy and grace. Given that is the case, the law actually points to Jesus Christ. So in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, it says this, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law is our guardian. It points us to Jesus. Why he was there is showing us our need for Jesus, why Jesus came. And Jesus the fulfillment of the law, saying, you know what, now you can apply that mercy and grace which you need in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Moses, the writer of the law, points to Jesus. But not only Moses, what you have here in verse 3 also is Elijah. He said, why is Elijah here? Well, Elijah is a prophet. Here, he is the representation of all the prophets. 
So what do the prophets do? The prophets actually point people to the law, right? The law is there. The prophets are saying, hey, you're not following the law. Follow the law. You're a sinner. You're sinning before God. Look at the law. That's what the prophets do. They point people to accountability before the law. And so Elijah was doing this. He said, hey, look at the law. If people looked at the law, they would know how much they need a savior. At the same time, Prophets are also prophesying about the Messiah in the Old Testament. There are about 1,500 prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. So Elijah here is also pointing to the Messiah. Both Moses and Elijah are pointing to the Messiah. And here we see in verse 3, they were talking. Elijah and Moses were talking to Jesus. He said, what are they talking about? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us what they're talking about, but Luke actually does. In Luke chapter 9, verse 31, it says this, the conversation between the Moses and Elijah and Jesus is about his departure, about the departure of Jesus. So what kind of departure? It's about him coming to the earth, and then he's going to die on the cross. He's going to be crucified, right? Die on the cross, die for our sins, and he's going to die. He's going to be buried in the tomb for three days, and he's going to rise again. He's going to depart in that way. And through that departure, he's going to save the world from its sins. So Elijah and Moses are excited about it. They, through their entire life, they've been looking forward. Right? Moses has been writing the law of God, looking forward to the Messiah. Elijah has been prophesying, looking for the Messiah. Finally, now the Messiah is here. They're gathered together, and they're also pointing to the Messiah, saying, this is exactly what we've been looking for. This is what the Old Testament prophecies have been all about. And in that sense, what we see here is Peter. This is what Peter's response in light of the glory of God, in light of the power of God, in light of the grace of God, in light of the strength of God, Peter said to Jesus, and then this is the glory that's been revealed. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. It is good. It is awesome. It is, it is great that we are here. It is wonderful that we are here. I could stay here forever. I could be with the Lord forever. This glory, this power, and this strength, this kingdom, I could be here forever. I mean, I mean, Peter was willing to surrender everything. I mean, he was willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to give up my family. I don't need to go back to my family anymore. Right? He said, I'm going to build a tabernacle, three tabernacles, one for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. We can live here forever. That's what heaven's like. We could be here forever. I don't need to go back to disciples. I don't want to go back to the simple world anymore. I don't want to go back there anymore. That's for them. I'm here. I can be here forever. Yeah. Willing to stay. Willing to stay. That's what heaven's like. You know, so a lot of times I've been to funerals, and funerals will always say, you know, I'm, willing, I'm, I'm waiting to see my loved ones, right? You have loved one passed away, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, maybe your precious little one who passed away. You know, I, I just can't wait to see this person in heaven. It's true. We can't wait for them, but I bet you the, the feeling is not mutual. <laughs> the feeling is not mutual. I mean, they're there in heaven. They're worshiping Jesus, not thinking about you at all. They're not thinking, I mean, Peter is willing to say, you know, I'm not going to go back to my wife anymore. <laughs> I'm willing to be with Jesus. You know? That's what he's saying. So we have, we have people pass away in our church, too. You know, five people passed away last, last year and a half. Members, we say, you will miss them. But when I see them, you know, I'll be like, hey, we missed you. They're like, okay, cool, man. That's cool, dude. Like, just worship Jesus, right? Like, like they're saying, no, just, just, just look at Jesus. That's what you're here for. And we might be distracted, right, for the first 20 minutes of looking for our loved one. And after we'll be like, no, no, we're, we're looking for Jesus. That's what, that's what heaven's about. That's what Peter's experience is, right? He never knew what his heart would feel. But he knew when he saw the glory of God, he said, you know what, once I saw this, I just want to be here forever. I don't need to be anywhere else. He recounts this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. This one, he's older. He said this. For we did not follow a cleverly despised myth when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When, we, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. Amen. says, it's not a myth. I saw it. I was in it. I was in the glory. This makes sense. This is why I'm sacrificing my, sacrificing my life to live for Jesus Christ, because I saw that glory. I would embrace that in a minute. If Jesus will call me home right now. Right. John says the same thing in John chapter 1, verse 14. 
and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I've seen it. I've heard it. i felt it. I'm willing to give up all, sacrifice all for the surpassing glory that has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It's a joyful thing. I'm willing to do it. So not only is Jesus saying what we see here, if you're willing to follow him, deny your cross and follow him, if you, if you, if, if you see who he is, if you, not only if you, if, you, if you just see the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are willing to live for him. It compels you to live for him. You want to give up all. You want to sacrifice all. You want to deny yourself, carry the cross, and follow him. But yet, it is not a burdensome thing. It is not a, 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 a dutiful thing which you just do because, because you just feel that you have to do it. We saw here also, it is something you do because you would joyfully do. You would joyfully do, but that's not the only thing. So not only seeing Jesus compels you to live for Him, not only seeing Jesus compels you to live joyfully for Him, seeing Jesus compels you to live reverently for Him. That's our third effect. Seeing Jesus compels you to live reverently for Him. We see this in verse 4 to verse 8. Verse 4 to verse 8 says this, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will build three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. When they lift up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Amen. Powerful, powerful words. And so... Continue on, you have Peter. Peter is saying, you know, God, it's so good that we're here. I'm willing to stay here forever. I'm willing to be joyful with you forever. I'm willing to live for you forever. I'm willing to be this place. It's almost just like good, good as heaven. You know, I've had some good fishing days, but this is beyond everything I could ever imagine. I'm willing to be here. In fact, let's do this. Let's build a tent for Jesus. Build a, a tent is for tabernacle, by the way. Let's put the tabernacle for Jesus. Build a tabernacle for Moses. Build a tabernacle for Elijah. We could be here forever. And actually, he doesn't know what he's talking about because in Luke chapter 9 verse 33 says this Peter do not know what he's talking about he doesn't know what he's talking about he says you know what he doesn't understand the cross he just wants to be here forever in fact he has some kind of uh, um, misunderstanding of Moses and Elijah as well Moses and Elijah appear in glory and he's thinking you know what if they're in glorious state perhaps they should have a tabernacle and Jesus has a tabernacle tabernacle is a place of worship maybe Moses deserved one maybe Elijah deserves one maybe well Jesus definitely deserves one so let's build Three tabernacles for all three glorious beings here. There's no way he's talking about. So he had to be shut up. He had to be quiet. This is when God actually shuts up Peter. In verse 5, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is the Shekinah glory. That's the Hebrew term for the visible glory of God. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. God leads the Israelites from a pillar of cloud. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 through 11 says this, When the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the cloud, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You have the priest that cannot even minister, cannot even stand, was so fearful because a cloud moved in. Terrified, cannot do their work. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, we saw this already, but again, Jesus himself, the Son of Man, sitting on the cloud with sickle in his hand. A cloud is a symbol of God's judgment, God's righteousness, God's purity, God's holiness, God's power, God's strength. And anyone who are in the cloud, who is in the cloud, will bow down terrified before God. It's exactly what happens to Peter here and the disciples here in verse 6. But nevertheless, we see what the presence of God does to Peter and John and James in verse 5. While Peter was still speaking, this is the voice from the cloud says, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Literally, God is, like, literally Peter was speaking. He's like, you know, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. God says, Peter, shut up. Shut up. The cloud moves in. Don't worry about Elijah. Don't worry about Moses. This is the one. Jesus. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Stop talking, Peter. 
If you don't talk, you'll learn something today. Listen to Jesus. And at this point, Peter and the rest of the disciples were terrified. We see in the verse 6. Disciples heard this. They fell down on their faces. Were terrified. They were scared. At this point, the disciples don't quite understand the cross. They don't understand the mercy of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. They were terrified at the presence of God, as they should be. As they should be. I mean, God is holy, and they're sinful. They should be terrified in this presence of God's pure holiness. And yet the beauty of this passage ends in verse 7, verse 8. Jesus came to them and touched them, saying, Rise, have no fear. And when they looked up, lift up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Jesus, again, is human appearance. I mean, this is glorious. Jesus is the glorious God. He appears as glorious majesty. At the same time, he is perfect man. He's just like us. He's a human being just like us. When they're terrified, we have a mediator who is just like us, can touch us and say, have no fear. Have no fear because I'm going to die for you on the cross. I'm going to represent you. I'm going to, sh- I'm going to, I'm going to be your substitute. Yeah. I'm going to give you all of my righteousness and all my purity so you no longer have to be that fearful before God. Not a terrifying fear, but rather now you get to revere God. You get to respect God, knowing that you have been made pure as God is pure. You see, in this world, there's a difference between fear of God from a believer and fear of God from someone who is not a believer. In this world, there's a, there's a difference. And, and the world would need more fear than this world. This world lack fear before God. This world does not know what it means to fear God. They don't. They just walk around thinking I don't own everything. But God is coming one day. He is. You know, I give you an illustration. These days I take my kids walking. We go walking, we go walking on the street and walk on the sidewalk. And um, sometimes we walk to, across, uh, to a busy, busy intersection, just like the one in Hollywood by them, pretty busy. Just walking around and just just so that we can get to places. And um, we're walking on the corner of the street and the corner of the sidewalk and right, pat, uh, right at the corner where the, the car will cross the intersection to get to us. And um, as we're walking there and we're standing there as a family, a couple of my younger kids would just stand really close to the sidewalk right next to the street. I'm like, hey, you got to come back here. I've seen enough crazy drivers. I don't know if you're going to ride onto the sidewalk and hit us all, right? Just get back here. Get behind me because it's dangerous. I've seen enough danger. My kids don't know. They don't know because they have no experience in life. They're just thinking like a three-year-old, five-year-old. They don't know the dangerous in this world. I'm an adult. I have seen enough dangerous in this world to know how dangerous, how, how fast these cars can be. You see, the people of this world are the same way. They're adults, but regarding the things of God, they're just two-year-olds. They don't understand how dangerous God is. God is a very dangerous God if you're not part of his mercy and grace. He's extremely dangerous. And yet, the world mocks God. The world mocks God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 4. This is how they mock God. Verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers, that scoffers will come in last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the coming of his promise? For ever since the fathers fall asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They're saying, where is God? I lived here for 30, 40, 50 years. I haven't seen God, so therefore God must not exist. Not knowing that God's from eternity to past, eternity to future. They're determining that God doesn't exist by the short, short span of life. They're foolish. Just like two-year-olds yes. in their spiritual understanding of God. But the reality is that God is coming. Not a car, but a train is coming. It's going to barrage through everything that is in His way. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, he saw this. Isaiah saw the glory of God high and lifted up. Jesus himself sitting on the throne of God with angels next to him crying out, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. The whole world is what? Full of his glory. The whole world is full of his glory. And when he saw it, he'd go like, Well, I'm going to... No, he actually bowed down with his face onto the ground. What did he say? He said, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am lost 
I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have what? Seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I have seen the king and I have, I, I'm undone. Woe is me. I am unclean. I'm sinful. I mean, this is the reaction the world does not understand. When they see the Lord high and lifted up on the eternal day, if their sins are now forgiven, they're going to cry out and say, Woe is me. What? What can I do? I mean, it's an understanding that's beyond their understanding right now. But when they see the glory of God, they will understand that day. That fear, that terrifying fear for anyone who does not know, know the Lord Jesus will come upon anyone, everyone whose sins are not being forgiven. Yet, in this case, Isaiah's sins was forgiven. In Isaiah chapter, actually Isaiah chapter 6, if you're there, you don't have to turn there. But in that very incident, what the angel did was that he took or angel, assuming it was a seraphim, um, a person, the angel, took a coal from an altar. He said, why a coal from an altar? Well, an altar is a, a place of sacrifice. Jesus is a sacrifice. As a sacrifice was being sacrificed, and the blood of the sacrifice dripped down from the altar onto the coal, the angel took the coal and touched Isaiah's lips and said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are atoned for. You're made clean before God. And that is the same touch that we see Jesus touching the disciples with in verse 7 of chapter 17. But Jesus came and touched them and says to them, Have no fear. Have no fear. Rise. This is encouragement of Christ. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you accepted his salvation, accepted his death and his resurrection for you, certainly you will have no fear in the eternal day. That's our interaction with God. We have no fear. We're reverently respecting God, but not a terrifying fear as unbelievers are having or will have in that eternal day. In that light, our relationship with God is this. We're joyful before Him. It's fun to be with God. It's fun, right? We're His friends. I, in John chapter 15, verse 15, it says this, I called you friends. For all that I've heard from my Father and made known to you. Jesus calls us friends, and yet... He's our father. He's our reverend father. We're to approach God with a lot of fun, a lot of joy, but at the same time, we revere him, we respect him. And this is how ministry is to be done. There's a lot of fun that we can have here. There's joy in worshiping God. There's joy in evangelizing. There's joy in telling people about Jesus. There's joy in serving one another, right? In serving the Lord. There's a lot of joy. But at the same time, it's a reverent thing that we do. It's a solemn thing that we do. We don't take it lightly. We're committing what we do. It's not just a side hobby. It's our lifelong commitment because God is worthy of our commitment. He is. So it's joyful, yet it's serious. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says the same thing. And it calls all of us to partake in this work. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as one loving sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is spiritual worship. There is a spiritual worship which we are all offering to God. It's all of us, right? Many bodies, bodies plural, but coming together as one, right? Living sacrifice. And your sacrifice, sacrifice is not easy. It's not easy to sacrifice, not, especially when you're alive, right? You're living sacrifice. It's like you're still there, right? Being sacrificed. But yet, it's a spiritual act of worship. It's fun. It's joyful. It's reverent. It's, it's something that you're serious about. In that light, that's the, in that light, we're coming to Jesus, right? Jesus is saying, if you know me, if you see me, if you understand who I am, then you will change your life. You will commit your life to me. You'll be compelled to live for me. You'll be compelled to live joyful fully, fully for me, and then you'll be compelled to live reverently for me. See, Jesus is coming. He is coming. He may seem far away right now, but he is coming. He may seem far away to the people of this world, right? People who don't know him, people who think this world is going to keep going the way it is, but he is coming. He is coming. Amen. You know, these nights, so I go out in the nighttime, I would see stars in the sky. And you see stars in the sky, they're twinkling, they're dim, and it seems like they're just pretty peaceful and pretty dimly lit and calm night. But did you know, did you know that particular star, or many of the stars, but just one star out there, is only dim and calm because it's billions and billions of light years away. But if it moves in, if that star moves in any closer, you will see that particular star 
is orders of magnitude larger and more powerful than our sun, perhaps even more powerful than our solar system. It's all larger. You see, the same to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, today, people see him, they're all so calm, so lovely, so kind. But he's coming. He's coming in power. He's coming in strength. He's coming in dominion. He's coming in his kingdom. He's going to swallow up everything in his way. And we must be ready. He made a way for us through the Son, Jesus Christ. He himself died on the cross so that we can be of the same nature as his, so that we will not be swallowed up, but rather will be received under his glory. That is the promise. And that is a promise for each one of us today, which we can, which we can embrace. May each one of us pray, any one of us who don't know the Lord Jesus, embrace him in light of his future coming. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the display of your glory here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, to Matthew chapter 17, verse 8. That display of your glory changes us, shapes us. Lord, after we have seen you this morning, God, I know that each one of us may apply this to our own individual applications. And I pray, Father, that you will result us in us living a holier life, for you living a life of service, living a life of gratitude, living a life of sacrifice. Lord, because you are coming. In light of your coming, God, every single service and sacrifice is worth it. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.